The title of my sermon is In Covenant, and I preached this on Sunday, June the 16th, 2019, at uh, Prospect, Trinity, As and Asbury United Methodist Churches in Harrington, Delaware. My name is the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Jamison. So I'm going to ask the question, what does it mean to be in covenant with God? And in this sermon, I'll do my very best to try to answer that question. You know, the moment that we were accepted by Jesus Christ, and he came into our heart, you know, a long list of things happened all at the same time. You know, one of the things that happened is that we voluntarily entered into a covenant with God. Now, I used to think that a covenant and a contract were pretty much just two words for the same thing. But you know what? I found out that they are not the same thing. They are very different. You know, I'm 63 years old, and I've preached hundreds of sermons about the Bible, but this is my first sermon about covenants. Like the other words that we have considered in this sermon series, uh, covenant is a powerful metaphor, and the picture I think of for this metaphor is two people making an agreement together, and of course, the opposite of that is a disagreement. We all know what that looks like. In this short sermon, I will not be able to explain biblical covenants completely because it's a really big topic and it goes from Genesis to Revelation. So what I'm hoping for is that you will learn a little bit today and be inspired to want to learn more about the covenants in the Bible. So let's compare and contrast uh, contracts and covenants just a little bit. Uh, let's say that you decide to sign a contract with a business or an individual person. Uh, let's call it a contract for pest control at your house. Okay, so if you or the pest control company uh, want to call it quits uh, on the contract, that's okay. It's not a complicated or binding contract. Either party can decide to end the contract at any time. So human contracts tend to be short-term, but a divine co covenant... A divine covenant lasts forever. Now, what happens when we violate the agreement we have with God? Well, doesn't that break the covenant and make it void? Oh, no, it doesn't. If we violate the conditions of the covenant we have with God, or if we decide to call it quits, the covenant doesn't go away. Um, the reason for that is that God is never ever going to back out. You know, if we sin, and, and we do, there will be consequences, but God keeps loving us just the same, and he works to rescue us. He never breaks the covenant. Now, business and legal contracts are between equals, you know, but biblical covenants are not equal because God is so much greater than we are. Contracts can be proposed by anybody, but biblical covenants they only come from God. A contract is a legal tool that's used to bring it about an agreement, and it will carefully spell out who does what and when. It is used in business and government and education and all sorts of agreements, large and small. You know, we're all used, if you're an adult, <laughs> you, you sign on the dotted line and, and you make contracts all the time. But a biblical covenant isn't based on human laws, human customs, or our motives to make money. You know, it's a relationship between God and us, and completely and utterly based upon the grace and the mercy of God. So the moment you became a Christian, you entered into an ancient biblical covenant that will never, ever end so let's talk about the Old and New Testaments. Uh, the Bible has two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did you know that the word testament, it is an old English word that means covenant. So really, the Bible is all about covenants. Now, let's look at some of the covenants of the Old Testament. The covenant with Noah. You know, it was, uh, there's four four pieces here to these covenants that uh, they have in common. Uh, number one, it was God's idea, completely and utterly. Um, it lasts forever, and there is a visible sign, of course, the rainbow. And it was accepted by animal sacrifice. And you might wonder, well, how is that possible? I mean, if, if, if there was only two of every animal on the ark, well, if you read it carefully and you go back and you look at the story, you'll see that uh, Noah brought extra cattle. So let's talk about the covenant with Moses that God had with Moses. Uh, number one, it was God's idea. Number two, it lasts forever. 
it's still in force. Uh, number three, there is a visible sign, and that was the Sabbath. This made um, the Jewish people completely different than all the other people in the world because they had a special day which they set aside to worship God and to rest. And number four, it was accepted by animal sacrifice. You know, God asked Moses to build the tabernacle, and in the, at that tabernacle there was uh, animal sacrifice. So uh, let's take a look at the covenant that God had with David. Uh, like the previous covenants, uh, it had these four qualities. Number one, it was God's idea. You remember that uh, David wanted to build a temple because uh, uh, the people no longer lived in tents. Now they had their own houses, and uh, David felt that uh, since God was living in a tent, that he needed to build a temple for him. So you remember the story, right? So uh, David told uh, the, the prophet, uh, I believe it was Nathan, that uh, he wanted to build a house for God. And then God turned the tables and said, I'm going to build a house for you. And the, and the play on words, of course, was using the word dynasty in Hebrew, and it meant house. So this was God's idea. David didn't come up with this idea, but God did. And uh, the covenant lasts forever. And that's the second thing. The third thing is there is a visible sign. And it was a dynasty of kings that eventually led to Jesus in Bethlehem. So that Jesus is forever on the throne. So um, the fourth thing was that it was accepted by animal sacrifice. Now Solomon uh, was the first king to follow David, and he is the one that built that temple. Okay, so let's look at the New Covenant. This is the entire New Testament. And uh, the first thing is that it was God's idea. God is the one who provided all these Old Testament prophecies to, uh, to get the people ready for the Messiah. This, was, this had to be God's doing. No, no human being could, could think of something like that or do anything close to that. Okay, the second uh, feature is that it lasts forever. It's, it's still in force and it's going on. The third thing is that there is a visible sign, and I think this will surprise you. It's the Lord's Supper. Four, it was accepted by sacrifice. You know, Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. And because of his actions, uh, we were entered into a, a biblical covenant. Let's take a look at the sign. In, in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19, the, the Bible says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Okay, so I could not make this stuff up. Jesus established a, a biblical covenant between us and our Heavenly Father so that when we take communion, we are reminded of what Jesus did for us, and we thank God for accepting us into his covenant of mercy and grace. So communion is more beautiful than the rainbow that God gave to Noah, that communion is more countercultural than the Sabbath that God gave to Moses. And communion is more magnificent than the royal dynasty uh, that God gave to us in a covenant with King David. Communion is a better sign, and the New Testament shows us a better covenant because it represents our acceptance into the kingdom of God. Now, if you want to know more about this, read the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews kind of spells this out, what God was doing when he created this better covenant. Now, you and I have now been grafted in uh, included in a plan of blessing that will never, ever end. So I want to talk to you about a deeper commitment. This is the portion of the sermon that I talk about. How do we apply this information to our everyday lives? And so I guess I need to ask the question, how can we apply this concept of covenant to our everyday lives? Well, you know, I've noticed that I've been on a lot of retreats. And the last one I remember was going in January to the Youth Rally in Ocean City with some wonderful young people from uh, the charge here uh, in Harrington. Now let me tell you something. There's something personal that I've noticed that happens to me uh, whenever I attend a really blessed retreat. At some point during that retreat, uh, whether it was a walk to Emmaus or some other church retreat, you know, when I get away 
and seek God, he speaks to me in a, in a mighty way. And usually I come under conviction at some point and I need to get down on my knees and get quiet before the Lord. And sometimes I start crying and sometimes not. <laughs> it's just that I get a sense that God is in the room and I need to shut up and get out of the way. Well, this happened in uh, January at the youth rally, especially during the altar call that was given. There was three waves of altar call that were just incredible. I remember getting down on my knees at my, on in front of my chair. I'm sure the young people were looking at me, looking at me and saying, well, you know, it's the preacher. Of course, he does weird things. <laughs> and that wasn't it. It was God in the room. And so uh, this is what happens when I kneel like that and I talk to God. I make a recommitment. Now, I know that God has already saved me. He's in my heart, and, I, and that's all settled. And so I just simply ask God to help me love him more, to help me be more willing to do what he wants. You know, I learned a saying in Elkton when I was at Wesley Church in Elk, Elk Neck, the people there, they taught us this saying. They said, uh, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. And I will say what you want me to say. You know, <laughs> that's recommitment. And that is what happened to me at the altar call in Ocean City when I knelt at my chair. So I've noticed that that has happened a lot to me over the years, and every time I come back home a little closer to Jesus and a little bit more willing to do what he wants me to do. And I think I understand this better now because it really is a way for God to renew his divine covenant in me. You know, I discovered that it's an opportunity for me to get a little closer to Jesus, to be reminded that God never, ever stops being faithful, and he let me see that my relationship with him is where it needs to be. Dear ones, that is covenant. It's not rules. It's not a contract. It's not a ceremony. It's not theology. It is a living relationship. Now, I want to read this, uh, this scripture from Jeremiah 31, 31 to you and conclude my sermon. Uh, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Thanks for listening to this sermon.